for your mercy never fails. All my days I've been held in your hand. Amen. As soon as y'all can get those words up there, that'd be great because y'all know me, I'll make up my own words. Darkest. 
to do is this. We about to be. My God is big, so strong and mighty. Plan for me is victory, victory, victory. My God is big, is big, so strong and mighty.
Good morning, good morning. Two people in the room, mental health seem to be okay. Let's try that one more time. How are you guys doing today? All right. For our, for our older individuals, just can't use your outside voices. I gotta do this one more time. How are you guys doing today? That's what I'm talking about. A little bit louder. So on last week we talked about going into this month being intentional we're gonna talk about uh, domestic violence. On today, domestic violence, we're talking about uh, verbal. So um, the first part of this is gonna talk about the difference between domestic violence and normal uh, arguments, okay? So how many of you guys have been in a, or what you thought was an argument with your spouse, your best friend, your school, your kindergarten, high school uh, peers. Oh, man. Okay, thank you. Man, oh, you man. Are good. Oh, yeah. No kind yes. of arguments. We don't even need this test. Okay. So um, we all get into arguments from time to time. Sometimes we lose our cool and yell. It's all a part of being human. So now we know we're all human. Okay. Amen. Um, but verbal abuse is not normal. Amen. How many of you guys know that verbal Amen. abuse is not normal? Or have you even known you had verbal abuse? I bet you guys don't even know. So that's something to think about. Okay, so um, for, I'm gonna give you the normal, normalcy. Uh, here are some examples of what normal disagreements look like. They don't dissolve into name calling or personal attacks. They don't happen every day. Arguments uh, resolve around a basic issue. They aren't uh, character assassinations. You listen and try to understand the other person's position even when they are angry. One of you may yell or say something truthful, truly awful or um, out of frustration, but it's usual, an unusual occurrence and, may, and you guys have worked through it. Um, then we're gonna go into the red flags. <laughs> okay, red flags. Uh, they, ins they insult or attempt to humiliate you. Then they accuse you of being oversensitive or say that it was a joke and you have no sense of humor. How many of you guys ever heard that? Oh, of course. Okay. Um, they frequently yell or scream at you. Arguments take place uh, by surprise, but you are to blame for starting them. They try to make you feel guilty and position themselves as the victim. They say they say their harmful behaviors when they, when they are alone with you, but act completely different when, when you're with other people. Okay, and they hit the wall, pounds their fists, or throws things. And this is a thing that really is interesting to me. They want credit for not having to hit you. So how many times somebody said, you know I couldn't hit you? Because you made me do this, all right? Name calling, whether it's a romantic relationship, parent-child relationship, or the bully on the playground, name calling is unhealthy. Sometimes obvious, sometimes disguised as pet names or teasing. Habitual name calling is a method of belittling you. Here's an example for you. You don't get it, sweetie, because you're just too dumb. It's no wonder everyone says you're a jerk. Okay, then um, another attempt for belittling you is abuser uh, comments or sac uh, sarcastic, patronizing, is all to make themselves feel superior. Here's an example for you. Let me see if I can put this in simple terms that you can understand. I'm sure you put a lot of effort into your makeup, but go wash it off before yeah. someone sees it. Those, those are some of the things I give, I give you guys uh, the criticisms. There's nothing wrong with uh, cons constructive criticism, but in a verbal abuse relationship, it's uh, particularly harsh and persistent in an attempt to chip away at your self-esteem. 
So an example would be, you always upset about something, always playing the victim. That's why nobody likes you. You screw up, you screw up again, you can't do anything right. Those are some of the, some of the things. So just saying, you know, kind of think about that. And I know you guys can go home and be like, oh, that's what happened to me. Oh, man, I remember when such and such did say that. So, you know, this is remember day, just to get you guys to um, understand what different things are in mental health. So you, you at least have a better idea of what's going on. So manipulation, manipulation is attempt to make you do something without making it a direct order. Make no mistake about it. It's meant to control you and keep you in the out battle. Gaslighting, I guess we all think that's just not bad enough. Gaslighting is a sympathetic attempt to make you question your own version of events. It can make you apologize for things, it's not even your fault. It can also make you be more dependent on the abuser. Okay, so the abuser does things to make you feel that you don't know what's going on, you have no clue on, uh, as far as when it comes to money or people or this or different things. So when we talk about finances, if a old boy or old girl says, hey, I'll buy this for you or I'll do this for you, then you constantly depend on that person. And then after a while, they do themselves better at that point. Okay, so um, with that, we're gonna end it with that, Elijah. So I'm gonna have him read one thing and I'm gonna read the other one. So how we, your outlook is um, healing time, healing takes time, but it's important not to isolate yourself. Reach out to supportive friends and family members. If you are in school, talk to a teacher or a guidance counselor. If you think it will help, find a therapist who can help you in your recovery. Okay. Um, this is from our meeting from Proverbs 18.21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they, and they that love it shall eat the fruit there The second one is James 3, 6, and 2. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the, set the whole course of it, one's life on fire, and it is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, get this, birds, reptiles, sea creatures, are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But... No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings. Who have made, who is made in God's likeness? One of the, one, out of the same mouth come praise and, cur and cursing. My brother and sister, this should not be. Thank you very much. Amen. <laughs> Let church say amen, but Sister amen. Deborah and I are in health ministry. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Our mental health should be a part of our stewardship as well. Yes. Honestly, I, I believe the same investment you make physically, you should be able to make spiritually yes, sir. and mentally. Amen. Yes, sir. Right? Shalom means being whole. And Part of our wholeness is not only what we take in, but how we share what we've been given also. And that's when we come to our moment of stewardship. This is what this is. We, we now participate in the worship experience because your gift represents your worship. Amen? Amen. The Bible says, where your treasure is, yes, sir. there your heart will be also. Yes, sir. Now, I know Target doesn't need my treasure. Walmart doesn't need my treasure. But I bet if we look through our registry and our checkbooks and spending, they have more of our heart yes, sir. than possibly God does. Yes, sir. 
And wherever we are connected, we ought to be invested. Amen. And this is your body of believers. This is your local house of prayer. And the Bible says, bring your tithe. To the storehouse. Yes. I know you don't want to be under the law, but let's be under grace. The law says you owe 10%. Biblical law. Grace says you owe 100%. Who wants to live by the law now? I'll live by the law. Take this dime out of this dollar, God. But don't take all of me. No, God deserves all of us. Amen. So we're not paying. You don't have enough money to pay God. But with an honest, open heart, you can bring what you have been given and give it back to him cheerfully. Amen. We are Amen. preparing the sanctuary for our giving. I'm going to ask the deacons, the deacons to get the, our vestments ready. The ushers are at the back of the church. I'm going to ask you to take a moment with me in prayer to prepare for what we're about to do before God. Let's pray. God, we put to our hands what you've blessed into our lives. Now, circumcise our hearts so we give in the right spirit with joy and thanksgiving. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. You're in the amen. hands of our ushers. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you once again for letting us see another new day. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Bless the sick and the shut in. Bless the ones who are on their way. Give them traveling grace so they make it here safely. Bless the ones who are able to give. Bless the ones who are unable to give. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Now that we've given our gifts, I want us to take our few minutes, our seven minutes in the sanctuary is our time of prayer. It's a time where we try, at least here at Christian Love, we're trying to search out the voice of God. Amen. It's not always as easy as you would think. It's not just doing good, it's doing the purpose good. Amen. Amen. Good is always around us to do. You can always Amen. help somebody. You can always give of your resources. You can always share of your time and talent. But when we are maturing as believers, we must challenge ourselves to get beyond good and start looking for better. Yes. It's progressive. Mr. Alvaro tell me, good, better, best. Never let it rest. To your good is your better, and your better is your best. Yes, sir. And I can add one more stage to that and say, God desires us to be perfect. Amen. Yes. So we ought not stop until we have reached perfection. Yes. Somebody gonna say, I don't know what that looks like. Well, if you've seen Jesus, yes. you've seen perfection. Yes. He embodies everything that pleases the Father. And Jesus says, our goal is not to become perfect, but to become yes. like him. Yes. And if we will do his works and learn and hide his word in our heart and follow his urging by the Holy Spirit he gave us, he said, over time, that same God that started that good work in you, he will be faithful to complete it at the end. Amen. I'm a work in progress. Yes. And I bet you are too. But the good news is progress is being made. Amen. And we pray and ask God, continue the good work you've begun. And maybe we 
should step out of ourselves today. Amen. I always ask you to look yes. around. Yes. Do that. Maybe we need to unburden today. I, I saw the, the, the clouds, the, the weather outside, and maybe you're feeling like that on the inside. You know, just a few clouds, blocking enough of the sun to at least let you know it's daylight, but it ain't too bright. That's right. Seem to be like from zero to 10, you're moving at about a 4.3. You're getting there, but you're not doing it well, and you ain't glad about it. That's right. So I'm going to ask us, that let's do a spiritual reset before we hear God's word. So whatever it is that got us disconnected, disjointed, dysfunctional, and disagreeing, let's leave it at the altar today. Yes, sir. I wonder if you, instead of looking for somebody, can look in yourself and say, here's what I'm about to leave as a sacrifice up here. Man. And can I tell you, the altar is for your problems and your progress. Yes, sir. Bring good and bad because it's all in God's hands. So I'm asking if you have a prayer request, if you have someone in your circle of influence that needs God's provision or presence, if there's a family member struggling, is there a friend in a situation or circumstance, come to the altar and bring that name, that issue, that person with you. And if you're worried about coming because you got stuff, we all got stuff, we just don't always come to pray about it. And the Bible says that's the very reason it's not answered. You have not because you ask not. And then when you ask, you ask amiss. Yeah, I'm begging you to pray because when you get better, we get better. When you unload, we become lighter. When you let it go, God frees all of our hands. And what we ought to do is if you got nothing going on, stand by somebody up here with something going on. And say, it ain't me today, so I'm with you, but you be with me tomorrow. Because we know that as sure as the day has a rising and the night has a setting, tomorrow has issues of its own. We pray today for God's peace today, for his provision today. There's an old hymn the church used to sing. Um, Brother Jacobs, you know this one? Pray for me. Pray for me. Oh, my brother. Oh, my brother. Pray for me. Say pray for our sisters one more time. Pray for me. Pray for me. Oh, pray for me. For me. Oh, my sister. Oh, my sister. into that space of darkness so that light can come. God, we come this morning broken, battered, bruised, and barren. The weak has ravaged our faith, our hope, our trust, our optimism, our love, our generosity. We come before a full father as empty pitchers. Before we ask for you to fill us, first God, forgive us against thee and thee alone have we sinned and done these things in your sight. Oh, but the word of God says that if you wash us, 
will be made white as snow. So God, as the psalmist has sought you, we sought you, created us clean hearts. Renew the right spirit within us. Blot out our sins and wash away our transgressions. Chasing us, not because we're in trouble, because we're in relationship. For whom you love, you discipline. Oh God, we come because there's nobody else that even cares about the bear, the weight we bear. There's no one else who can change our circumstance. People have good intentions, but you've got all power. So we come before you and say, God, lift away the weight of the world. Parents are at this altar asking you to take the heaviness of their children off of them. Children are here saying the weight of being responsible, knowing my plan and purpose, finding my place in the world, I leave it at your altar. Somebody, God, needs answers to confusing situations. Somebody needs guidance through struggling relationships. Somebody's doctor has told them to get their affairs in order. Somebody's got a loved one bearing infirmities from illnesses and diseases. But we know a great physician. We know a wonderful counselor. We know an advocate who mediates between God and man. We know a peace that passes all understanding. We know a God who can do anything but fail. And even if he won't deliver us from the furnace of this world, our God is able. And we still won't bow. So God, you might leave us in our circumstance, but your word says you'll never leave us alone. So in that place of brokenness where that loved one is, whisper to them, lo, I am with you. In that hospital room where the prognosis is bleak and the family is despondent, whisper, God, I am with you. When death is certain and time has run out, usher us with the phrase, lo, I am with you always even until the end of the age. God, we want to worship this morning, but we can't worry and worship. God, we want to praise you this morning, but we can't lift our hand and praise and hold on to our problems. So God, with empty hands, with open hearts, with loose thoughts, we bring our issues to your altar. And we sacrifice them right here. And God, if we're going to worry, we ain't going to pray. But because we're praying, we're going to let go of worrying. Yes, 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 yes. We might not know the answer, but we know the one who has the answer. We might not know what tomorrow holds, but we know the one who holds tomorrow. The sun might not be shining over Stanislaus County, but the light of God still shines in the darkness of man. God, when the rain falls and the storms rage, we know somebody who can say, peace, be still, and everything will obey. So will you hear our worship today? Will you honor our reading of your word with hiding it in our hearts? Will you tear away the hardness in us and Rip out the thorns and thistle that choke out good seed. Will you chase away the fowl that come to devour it before we plant it? And will you let us grow good fruit and do your will until you come back to get us? And I can't wait. The Bible says one day soon the lightning will flash, the thunder will roll, and the dead in Christ will rise. And us who remain will be caught up to meet you in the air. God, will you give us the word that makes all our sadness and sorrow and sickness and disease worth it? Will you say the thing that made our dying day our everlasting life? Say, well done, 
good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few. Now I'll make you ruler over many. Oh, we love you, God. Save somebody today. Touch somebody's heart today. Encourage the downtrodden today. Put a smile on a sad face today. Give strength to the weary today. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say amen. Please don't forget to pray for me. Pray for me. Oh, yeah. Pray for me. Oh, my loved ones. Oh, my loved ones. Pray for me.
church say amen. Every now and then we need to be reminded that not just because it's Sunday, but resurrection is the reason we rejoice. If he didn't get up, he's just like every other good man who the grave has robbed us of. But because Jesus lives, the songwriter says, I can face tomorrow. Man, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Voices of Christian Love. I appreciate you for uh, allowing us to witness your worship. Let's uh, pause for just a second and take a deep, deep breath in. Good cleansing. In just let that go. Because if everything just breathed, then everything ought to be praising. The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Don't let problems pre prevent your praise. We praise him in spite of what we do. That's the kind of God we have. And I ain't saying to lie about it, but rely on the fact that that good work he's begun, he is faithful. So when you're tired, God is still trudging on. Amen. Rest in him while you trust in him. Amen. Amen. All right. There's a word for us this morning. There's a word. If you have your Bibles and if you believe. Yeah, go back to that one, Sylvia. I like that one. I, I tried to introduce a way for us to put our our 
customs in front of our company. And, and we do strange things, but I'd like to explain strange things so they won't be strange to you. When we stand, when we read God's word, it's the same honor the world demands. When a judge duly elected enters the room, they say, all rise, and we all pop up because we're scared to go to jail, I guess. When the Senate is in session, they say, the president of the United States, and everybody gets up, no matter who walked through that door. Well, if God's word is the reason for all of this, reading it ought to bring a reverence to us. And, and I like to stand to show that reverence to God. Not only if you're physically able, I don't want you to be in medical jeopardy trying to be spiritually solid. Amen? But when we stand, we're going to read, and we're going to honor God's word with our attentive prayer and time. If you have your Bibles, join me in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 7 through verse 12, we'll conclude our sermon series on discernment in this gospel letter. When I'll have it, say amen. Mine will be the New Living Translation. I'll read aloud while you read silently. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, and there the Bible says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Verse 12, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. For a thought as you take your seat, let's discuss a little while the ask of discernment. The A-S-K of discernment. Amen. Let's pray. God of great glory and honor, we come before you looking to hear from you. We have sung praises. We have lifted prayers. We have brought our sacrifice. But if you don't speak, we leave empty. I am not much, but I'm yours broken and battered and bruised, I ask you fill me with you and empty me of myself. Taking charge of my mannerisms, my, my, my mouth and my emotions and use them to your discretion so that the Holy Spirit can communicate truth to us and through us. And then God, don't let it just die in our ears, but let it rest in our hearts and become fruit that pleases you the most. Finally, we ask that the words of our mouth the meditation of our heart will be acceptable in your sight. For, Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say amen. Amen. It has been quite the journey through these, these few chapters. Uh, these Sundays we've spent just scratching the sur surface of the sermon. It, it's been interesting because... Discernment in and of itself is such an open term. Folk throw discernment at you, and we will call it wisdom. We will call it knowledge. Some of us will even call it a, a, a soothsaying vision into the future. We treat it almost like telepathy or a psychic event, that the knowledge of what God wants and doesn't want, the awareness of where your life should go and where it shouldn't, it should not be left up to some unexplainable, mysterious encounter. There ought to be a way for us, just as God-given humans, that means those things he created to breathe and operate and move, that if he had a way of knowing him, 
he must have also applied a way for us to know what he has for us. It's not easy because anything worth having, worth doing, worth obtaining ought to cost you something. No one cherishes the free toaster from the bank. Do banks give free toasters? No, they don't. That, that's old practice. Maybe your travel club wants to sign you up for an email list and promise a cooler for you to keep your drinks in. You'll find that the stitching might not be sturdy. It, its use might not be productive. You'll even find that what they gave you for good might turn into grief for you because it wasn't meant to last. It's a token. That's all it is. But discernment is not token-driven. You, you don't pray one time for one right step. It's almost as if if we will have discernment, we must be first given it, and then we must practice it. Now, maybe I ain't talking about what y'all need to hear. Maybe y'all got somewhere else to be. It is the final day of the NBA season. And they are still seeding positions in jeopardy. Your team might be jockeying for their play-in tournament. Maybe the Warriors are in here praying extra hard not to gain that number one so Denver will run roughshod over you. Just, I understand you might be distracted, but for a few moments, discern that what God might be saying now might be more important than what Steph and the Warriors will do later. Because when you're looking for an answer, the Warriors won't help you. No, they have problems of their own. And they are on court today, but tomorrow they'll be looking for discernment. And maybe you can help them if they don't help you later on. Amen? Good, you're back in the building. The ask of discernment means that to be discerning disciples, it requires something of us. Now, that's a bad word in church because we come in here because everything's free. You know you can spend a pretty good evening of entertainment, of fellowship, and possibly food for a little more than a dollar. Amen. Any Sunday you feel struggled for any of those things I've named, drop by any local church. And they'll be so glad to see you that they'll sing to you all morning. That they'll stand and acknowledge you and your family. And, and if you pick the right Sunday, you'll get a sumptuous meal in their fellowship area. And they'll ask little of you, just the Baptist dollar. Amen. Who got their dollar in their hand today? Amen. That, that's what we, we have a token to God. We just want to show that we're in the house. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of giving token discernment when I need deliberate discernment. And I'm tired of going to the church to be entertained and leaving uneducated. See, when I come into God's house for prayer, I either expect to know God better or know how to know him better by the time I leave. And it's not necessary to sing me happy or shout me silly or either feed me till I won't no more. I would rather have the bread of life than the bread from my wife. Everybody understand what I'm saying? That if we are going to be serious about God, we should be serious about our seeking from God. We should be serious about our asking of God. And we should be serious about our knowing and knocking for access to God. Discernment has an ask of you while you're asking for discernment. For four weeks we've been studying. We've covered. We've journeyed to Peter's understanding. We've touched down in Old Testament territory to see if it's principled in Levitical law. And finally, here we are, back at the beginning. For a, a serious Bible student, Matthew 7 should have struck a chord with you. Matthew 7th chapter, along with preceding and uh, former verses speak from the Sermon on the Mount. The, the first place Jesus gathered all those first start believers when he was putting out the pitch for what living on purpose would look like. 
He talked about what his new disciples would have to endure. He talked about some things you'd have to change in your behavior. He set the principles and standard of what we say following Christ means. What he said back then needs to be what we say and hear today. And I find it interesting that when we started this journey looking for discernment, we come back to the beginning again, and discernment is found just where the seeking started. If you want to know what God wants of you, ask Jesus. He already knows. Not only does he know what God has purposed for his life, but he also has encompassed what God desires for your life. And I got to help somebody here. God don't need no more church members. He needs no more buildings built to his name. He, he needs no more sanctuaries erected for worship. God is looking for those who will give their bodies as a temple, who will be living sacrifices. I'm going to let y'all go today. I know y'all got a lot to do. Let's talk about this ask of discernment. I see two big things it asks from three little things. It asks two big things from three little things. Here are the two big things I see. I see it, it asks our responsibilities to the Lord. That's what discernment says. It's going to show us our responsibilities to the Lord. And it's going to also show us our responsibility to the world. Because sometimes we think discernment is just about our stuff. If y'all with something, your life is not your own. When you got saved, you also cried surrender. To accept his salvation is to give up self. So when you start asking for discernment, remember, it'll never be about you. It'll always be about him and them. I'll say it one more time. Discernment is never about you. It's about him and them. All right, I'm going to go through these because when we get to our responsibility of the Lord, those three things ask three things of us. Matthew chapter 7 is an interesting passage of Scripture because Jesus doesn't necessarily have a captive audience. They're not really committed yet. They're not really following yet. They're at the precipice of purpose. That means they're right at the start. They, they ain't even begun to understand what sacrifice is. They have no idea what struggles lay in front of them. They don't even really understand who it is talking to them. There's murmuring in the crowd as Jesus starts this sermon. They're saying stuff like, didn't his mama have a suspicious birth? I mean, Mary was pregnant, but she wasn't married. Y'all know how they talk? I heard that ain't Joseph's baby. Now, that's what they were saying. And, and, and matter of fact, not only is not Joseph's baby, but how good could he be? Because they are from Nazareth, right? And, and do, do good things come out of Nazareth? I don't think so. Nazareth was a lot like Modesto. I ain't talking about it. I'm just saying it's a city. But, but what are we known for? What, 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 what's the thing that draws people to this place? Do, do we have prolific cathedrals? Do we have uh, spacious mountain ranges? No, we're a gateway to that stuff. That means you got to go through here to get there. And usually when you're a place that folk go through, they really go through. They, they drive by and get you gas. They drive by and up your prices for your grocery and your hotel stays. They drive by and your tax debt gets higher. You have to pave roads and pay for accidents and keep traffic signal. It's a city, but it's, it's stuck a little in struggling. And sometimes we get defined not by who we are, but from where we come from. So we don't even speak like we from Modesto. We say, where you from? He said, you know where Napa is? Yeah, we a little south from there. We say stuff like, you know where L.A. is? Yeah, we, we are north from L.A. And, and we'd rather describe by places we see as important. But can I tell you something? Wherever God has placed you has become an important place. Because if he has you there, there are answers to life's issues where you are. There's purpose where you are. There's power where you are. It ain't necessarily where you're from. Y'all pick this up if I put it down. It's where you're at. And when I am 
at the beck and call of Christ. I'm at the place to be. And Jesus is putting out a clarion call. Whoever wants to follow me, follow these conditions. If y'all read through that sermon, he starts talking about how we treat one another. He starts talking about how our lives should be lived. Ooh, I even heard mental health moment talk about verbal abuse. You know, when Jesus starts saying what his disciples would endure, he never talked about verbal abuse. Because he expected his disciples not to be brought to breaking points or provoked by words. He said, if they slap you on one side, he didn't say if they call you a name. Now lean in here, sensitive Christians. The words ought not provoke your wickedness. I need to park there for a minute. Because before Jesus puts down principles, we got to understand procedure. That, that we ought not be provoked by what call, folk call us. Doesn't matter if they call you by your color or your condition or your character. None of those things apply because what you used to be ain't who you're about to be. But, but, but we'll let a name send us on a rage, we, we'll let a character flaw create conflict, but God demands that we be more disciplined than let language lead us astray. Hmm. And then he says, please don't judge others because you will be judged by the same measure. And then he states, if a man would judge himself, he would not be judged. And then verse seven of chapter seven explodes when he says these things to honor me only come by discernment matthew 7 verse 7 in the king james version sylvia if you've got king james under that new living translation can you put up matthew 7 7 in the king james i think it's right there in the slides in the king james find that right underneath the new living right there it's the next Bible under it. You'll see it over on the right-hand side. Just slide down those scrolls. It's right there you go. Look what he says here, y'all. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And I don't know why when Jesus was talking about procedures, we all start hearing about stuff. He was telling us what we'd have to endure, and all of a sudden, somebody interpret this verse that all you got to do is pray, and he'll give you whatever you say. Ain't that what y'all see? It just says, ask, and it shall be given. It says, seek, and you shall find. It says, knock, and it shall open unto you. See, if you don't have discernment, that looks like a direct order for anything. But discernment is the ability not to just do what you see, but understand what can't be seen. Because if Jesus just gave you a way to get your stuff, you don't need to follow him. Say amen, somebody. That's why discipleship is not interesting to us. The church has taught us a method to get products. We came to church and they said, just pray for the car and pray for the house and pray for the husband and pray for the wife. Pray for your character flaws. Pray for your empty pockets. Pray for your crazy thoughts. Can I tell you something? Praying for it ain't going to change nothing. Prayer doesn't change your circumstances. Prayer changes you. Oh, you thought you were asking a genie to drop you some wishes. Well, discernment can't be asked for. It must be given to. And if we stay in context, Christ is telling you this ain't a way to get anything. This is the way to get the one thing all of you will need. Discernment. And you know what I hear but ain't said? Prayer is the way to discern the will of God for our lives. And if we would pray productively, we would discern correctly. I got Bible for my theology. 
Sylvia, new living translation, same verse, because the Greek matters. New Living takes a translation of the Greek text and puts it in common English language. Not word for word, thought for thought. Greek is a picture language. It is meant to give a look at a process and idea, not point to a fact. Our English language is factual. I love beer. I'll leave you to understand and interpret that the way you want. But when the Greeks spoke, they meant I love like I love a drink. I love beer. Because I don't use the word for loving beer the same as when I say I love my parents. Two different kinds of love. But some of you love your parents like a good beer. Because you've been taught that there's no chip, no difference, no change, but language needs to be exquisite, impeccable. Say what you mean and mean what you say. So can I translate for what the writer thought Jesus might have been saying? If you're going to bear the weight of being disciple, a disciple, if you're going to get over prejudices and hang-ups and all the hiccups in your life, if you're going to be able to endure hardship, start praying and keep on praying. Start asking God and don't ever stop. No matter how much better you get, keep asking him to keep making you better. No matter how right the circumstance comes, continue to pray so right will stay. In don't quit. Don't cease. Don't stop. And here's where the ask of discernment goes. If our two big responsibilities, one being our responsibility in the Lord, then the first thing he says is be responsible to the command. Verse 7. You keep asking him for stuff, but he asks you to keep doing something first. Do you all understand cause and effect? Do you, do you understand the principle of causality. Maybe if you watch The Matrix, you'd understand this theory. So theatrically and eloquently shown by those two brothers making that great sci-fi thriller. Just go check either one of them and you'll watch causality play out. Causality is the course of events where one thing naturally leads into another. It's the inevitability of life when certain circumstances and forces begin to work, that there is a expected and predictable pattern of behavior with very few anomalies. That means once these things start, it's hard to stop what will inevitably happen. You, you become almost a victim of the circumstances. Somebody say amen here. Yeah. Y'all looking at me strange, but the Bible needs to be explained so we can stop just quoting it and know it. When Jesus was talking to his disciples, he was saying, I am asking you to begin the process of praying. And once you start praying, certain things will start to happen. You won't be able to stop them. You won't be able to make them work quicker. They'll just begin naturally because that's who God is. See, when I ask God's participation in my life, he naturally wants more than what I offer him. I say, God, I got this bad toothache. He says, that's fine. Lay back in the chair. I want to take x-rays first. I said, no, God, it's the molar in the back at the top. I just need you to drill it. God says, what I really need to investigate is your eating habits. I, I need to check the frequency of you brushing your teeth. I, I need to know if you're flossing or not. Y'all didn't know God was a dentist? No, no, you wouldn't know that because we only call the dentist like we call God for emergencies. When it hurts bad enough, now you want to know the dentist. Oh, come a little closer. Don't lean out. Lean in. Stop calling God at midnight hours. Because you didn't start praying at midnight. You started when you gave him your soul. 
And you want God to keep some phony covenant when your part of the deal is that once you started praying, you wouldn't stop praying. But if you like me and I'm like you, we stop praying when we stop going through. Anybody want to contradict that? Been a long time since you prayed to get your bills paid since you got that better job. Been a long time since you prayed for that spouse to say since you got your groove back. I'm going to let you put in there what that means. I don't even know what that means. But once we get satisfaction, we stop asking. The Bible says not only should you ask, but keep on asking. And listen, don't ask to your standards. Ask to his. I got Bible for theology. Because he says asking can't be done unless you have an anticipation to receive what you're asking for. Oh, wait a minute. Sounds like another card blanc I just gave somebody. I hear blank checks all over this building. He said, I can't pray unless I know I'm going to receive it. Now, make sure you write it just like I said it. Because if I said it, I got to guarantee it. But God said, ask and you shall receive. It ain't vague. It's based on your attention to detail. So you can't ask him once for one thing. God says, I need a consistent asking. And you know what the problem is? We stop asking when we get tired. We stop asking when we get frustrated. We stop asking when we get satisfied. But God won't be satisfied till you're securely with him. Your asking out of your circumstance doesn't necessarily bring you closer. Mm. I, I wish I had some truth sayers in here. I need one person who would tell the truth and, and say that you weren't the best child in the world. That you'll admit that corporal punishment was a part of your life. I see some wounded warriors in here. Some folk that know that any item at any time could become a disciplinarian device. You had to be careful where you acted up because you might get it right where you at. Mm. There's something about that. There's something about the threat of being put back in place. That we feel like if we couch our ask, not in what we really want, but what the Bible says we can have. We can get that and secretly what we want. God doesn't answer all asks. You can ask for everything, but just know God's not obligated to give it to you. Go ahead and pray for somebody's husband. Good luck for that. Go ahead and pray for a job you ought not be on. We see how that works out. See, God knows something you don't know. You're asking for what you don't know, but the one you're asking already knows. I, I thought I would help somebody right there. See, this is really a celestial guessing game. God knows something you don't know. And he's saying, I'll give you as many questions as you can ask to find out. God, am I supposed to be rich? He says, keep asking. God, am I attractive? Keep asking. Will I win? Will I lose? Will I grow tall? Will I be short? He says, ask. Keep asking. Keep. And you know what? You'll hear the right answer when I hear the right question. So you know what, y'all? I'm trying God out in a new way. I stop asking for stuff, and I start asking for him. See, I grew wise. The more I asked for Rod's stuff, the less God spoke to me. So I learned to figure out everything Rod wants, and I stop asking God for what I want. I'm trying to pastor now. If you really want to be productive in your time talking to God, first spend some time with yourself. Figure out your likes and your dislikes, your wants and your needs. Figure out your moods, your habits, your circumstances. Write down every temptation you might have. Write down every vision you might have. Think through every thought you ever entertained. And once you get all that listed, keep it handy. Because whatever ain't on that list might be from God. Wow. You know how you expect a big amen at some places. Because everybody said they don't know what to say to God, but I just gave you a whole body of work to do. You should have ran out the sanctuary and said, I got to get to writing. 
Because there's a lot of stuff I want. I want to be rich. I want to be sexy. I want to be cute. I want to be smart. I want to be powerful. I want to be authoritative. I want to be a rapper. I want to drive a Formula One race car. I want to go to the moon. I want a new drug. There's a lot I want. But my Bible tells me that my ways are not his ways. And my thoughts are not his thoughts. And here's the problem. You can't identify God because you don't know you. The command is to ask for what only God can give. Don't ask him just for what you desire. Ask for peace and God will give you peace. Ask for love and he'll give it in random places for unknown people. Ask for patience and he'll give you the ability to endure. But as for stuff, and you better get to work. Because you desire things that God has no use of for his purpose in your life. You want gifts. The giver wants you. The Bible says start asking and don't stop. That's the command. But ask is one half. The other part says not only ask, but then it says seek and keep on seeking. Keep seeking and you will find. Does anybody know that what we seek is not a destination, but a journey? I'll say it one more time. Believers should be seeking a journey, not a destination. I got Bible from my theology. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you will be also. He says, I, I do not leave you like that, because if I go, I'll come back again to receive you. Let me translate. He going to take you, because he don't trust your driving. I prepared a place but you don't really meet, read maps well. So I'll come back to take you where you need to go. So stop saying you're on your way to heaven. You can't get there until he picks you up. You're not on your way to heaven. You're either about to take a few days journey or a few decades journey. Somebody know disciples either walk for days, they either seek for days or seek for decades. Y'all don't, don't see that in Scripture? See, if it says, keep on seeking, some of us been looking for Mr. Goodbar all our lives. How many still trying to finish that BA? Still trying to win that corporate job? Give me five more minutes, and Megan Fox going to be my wife. Somebody thinking it. Somebody, I know Dwayne Wade got Gabrielle, but she ain't met me yet. Wait till I get down to Florida and introduce myself. You, you, you're seeking an opportunity to break through on an NBA squad. Some of you want to find your way into the Powerball winner's circle. We seek a lot of things. Y'all, to be honest, you started seeking for a few days. But you've been looking for this for a lot of years now. A lot of us got hurts and pains, not from the stuff we found but from the pathways we trod while we were seeking. You know, you got to be careful where you seek. Sometimes that path will lead you to some dark places that you can't get out of. Sometimes just seeking randomly, you might happen up on a group that mean you no good. Well, I wish I had somebody who read the Bible. One time this young man whose family had money demanded his portion of his inheritance. And he said, I need what's mine, Daddy. Break me off my bread so I can be about it. And he stood on business. I mean that. Daddy said, cool, cool, cool. Here your money. Be about it, Junior. Have at it. And as Junior, his journey, he found that the world will build a whole city just for your seeking. You know, it's one of them cities that never sleeps. Uh, where the bells are always ringing. Brother Starks, we don't know nothing about that, but I hear there's a place in the desert. 
where folk go and the stores never close. The bar is always open. Matter of fact, so many lights, it looks like daytime at 3 in the morning. You can't barely sleep. It's so much noise and action. But we wish we had a map or a testimony of what goes on there. This place is so good that it swears its visitors to secrecy. I don't know if any of this stuff is true because they all swear an oath that what happens there. They must say the same thing about church. Because they don't talk about what happened in Vegas, and they don't talk about what happens in here. You don't tell nobody that you were here praying because you had lost a good bit of change. You don't tell nobody that you were here seeking services because you had let your seeking make you sick. No, no, we go to Vegas in victory. We come to church to chill. Seeking decades is while some of us got to the Lord. We were wilderness wanderers. Yeah, yeah, we didn't believe God at the beginning, so we walked in circles for decades. Somebody in here right now, no, they're still paying off debt from their seeking. Still can't get the credit rating they need because of all the seeking they did in their young life. You needed a Discover card. You had to have a Sears card. You needed a Visa card because everybody else had cards, but you didn't consider that to have cards might need an income. And although the credit rating don't help me in my youth, in my old age, it matters. Because if you spend a life of seeking, folk don't trust you as secure. Well, y'all, God says, don't wander to find. Come to me seeking. Seek me and keep on seeking me. Come for what you want. Stay for what you need. You go ahead and write that one down. That's what church ought to be. I, I don't care what brings you in here. It, it don't matter. Just ask for whatever. You need a drink of water? We got water. But stay for a different kind of thirst quench. You might be hungry. We'll fix you a sandwich, but stay for the bread of life. Our problem is once we get satisfied, we go back seeking. Say amen, somebody. Ask, keep asking. Only talking to God about the things that God only has for you. Seek, but seek him and keep on seeking. Seeking stuff will have you walking circles where Jesus will have you walking secure. And that last one in that same command was, and knock. Can I pause here and say that there are no doorways in biblical context? No one had a front door. Please be clear. Do not see the images of the Western civilization you live in in the culture and context of Scripture. The wealthy might have had a gate to impede progress to their front door, but usually the wrap at any home was to a doorway, not a door. So to knock didn't necessarily mean on the front door of entrance. To knock meant to gain access into the courtyard. See, the courtyard of a home might as well have been the residence of the owner. If they didn't have homes sectioned off in rooms like we do. There were places dedicated to sleeping, but there was no dining room table. There was no place where the TV sat. There was no special room for your car. You lived and dwelt in a place that if you had livestock, they were right underneath you. They were housed in the lower level of the house while the humans would occupy the upper. In that middle chamber where sleep might have been done, at the upper chamber is where industry was created. Silk was drawn and laid to dry. Things were woven. Things were crushed and prepared. Homes looked different. You know what else? Access was different then. Sounds a lot like us. Do You know, I went to a friend's house the other day, and he told me, come by and pick up something. And I went by there, and didn't see his car in the driveway. He got back to my car. I sent a text. He said, just walk up to the door, Doc. I said, okay. I got out of my car and walked to the door, and I heard the cylinder in the dead boat slide. 
He said, tech came through. Go ahead and go in. I opened the door. I saw an item right where he said it was. Something else was right beside it. I got the wrong item. I got to the door. He says, hey, 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 hey. Don't take that one. He was speaking to me from his doorbell. He saw me real time. He unlocked his house from his job. What? What kind of insanity is this? That you can let somebody into a home that you are not even presently occupying. Can anybody get that code? Can strangers walk by my house and type a few and unlock? Possible. But look how quickly we trust. Because before you let strangers in, I read you let Amazon in. That you were letting complete strangers leave your valuable items inside of your place of residence. You know, that sounds like a lot like our lives. Because just as old days, you needed special access to gain entrance. These new days, we've given access convenience. Swipe left, and you can get everything you're looking for. You never got to know a name. You ain't got to understand their baggage. For all intents and purposes, they'll be everything you need them to be and nothing you don't want. It'll last for about three hours, and you can forget you ever met them. Y'all know what I'm talking about. What am I talking about? Don't say it, because a believer ought not be aware of things like that. No, I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. Houses are different because our habits are different. We allow things that God never, never gave us permission for. See, knocking assumes that where you want to go, you need special access to get there. Used to be the mailman had to knock on your door. He needed a signature before he released something to you. He need to verify not only that this was the right house, but I'm delivering the mail to the right person. But now anybody can pick up our mail. Matter of fact, some of y'all got mail that you shouldn't have because you've given people access to places not be. The Bible says, above all, guard your heart. For out of it flows the issues of life. Jesus is speaking to people who have had access restricted from them. Not only did they not know who to ask, when they did ask, they were not allowed. But Jesus says, I am here to give you full access to me, but only if you knock. Y'all know what? Some of y'all done came in the house, and you never knocked. Some of you climbed in through a window. Some of you came in through a back door. Some of you are here as a plus one. But there's something different when you seek permission and are given it. Your access feels different. When I ask the owner of a home to let in the home, the owner can give me what the doorway can. The doorway gives me entrance. The owner gives me access. The owner says, sit in that chair. Let me grab a drink for you to drink. Would you like a bite to eat? I get his home, listen to this, and his hospitality. Can I say something to you, believer, loved one? You ask for something, but you stop asking. You sought something, but you stop seeking. And one knock for salvation does not give you access to Christianity. You can be saved immediately. You must progressively be given your Christianity. I, I know the church never told you that. We thought we were all saved and all Christians the day we said yes. Wrong. Just like you weren't all grown when you were born. You were a baby, an infant. You needed somebody to carry you, somebody to and definitely somebody to change you. Raise your hand if you help somebody grow up. I'll carry it, I'll change it, I'll remove it, I'll doctor it. And when you became more able, you had more access. 
when you learn to be potty trained, they took you more places. They did more things because they could trust you to handle the business you need. Some of y'all need to go back to the early access days. We now treat Jesus like a black American Express card. We walk him into expensive places and drop it down like Jesus paid it all. Wrong. The debt might be paid, but you can't run up a new bill. Ask for permission to go and do. Ask for access to be and become. We stop asking God and start telling him. And I, Ms. Elvira would tell me, the day you tell me is the day you need your own. And I believe God is saying some of that to some of us. The command looks simple. The confidence is what looks good, too. Verse 8. He said, for everyone that asks, receive it. And he that seeketh, find it. And him that knock, listen to this, y'all, it shall be open. Confidence is a major thing. Confidence is what we lack as believers. I'm almost done. Some of us struggle with spiritual confidence. We worry that we're not quoting scripture right. We struggle if we have to pray out loud. Some of you are definitely afraid of being called to the front to speak in public. I want to help you with something. Christianity is not for the televised audience. It is not what you do in front of others. No, 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 no. It is what you are ushered into to only by God. Listen, you can get saved one way, but we become Christ-like in many ways. And the best ways to become like Christ are not public, they're private. How do we know your progress? You pray in secret, and God blesses. Is it in the Bible? I just want to make sure I'm quoting something that can be trusted. And for a lot of us, our confidence ought not be in what we're asking for. Our confidence ought to be in the one we're asking. I'll say it again. Not in what you want, but in who can give it to you. I have confidence that God hears every prayer. But I'm also equally confident that every answer ain't yes. We silver lining our seeking and knocking and asking for God. It's only God blessing our right ass. Sometimes God has denied you and it has delivered you. I wish somebody would testify. Not from the prayer that was answered, but the one that was ignored. The one where you knew it was for you, but in hindsight saw it would have been the death of you. Something that you knew in your immediate knowledge and God Revealed to you in delayed wisdom. What you wanted in your childhood, you can't stomach in your adulthood. I wanted a cotton candy cart. And I also don't want diabetes. Thank God he didn't give me my first prayer. These believers need to hear that God is not a magician. These believers need to hear that God has no magic potions. That there's nothing that comes from God that doesn't require patience and suffering. I'm trying to help you with some truth. To be a disciple is to wait on the Lord and endure hardship like a good soldier. We do not have an immediate gratifying God. We got a God that if we ask, he will eventually allow us to receive. If we seek, he will deliver us into what we're looking for. And if we knock, read that B part, he will open. In Israeli life, you could not enter unless the patriarch of the house gave you access. The maternal presence was not allowed to entertain outside company. Look up Jewish customs and lifestyles. That if the patriarch said no, even the birth, birth son could not enter. Maybe the son fell out with the father and would tiptoe around the mother when daddy was at work. 
the Jewish lifestyle says just because I'm not there doesn't mean you can sneak access. Once you are out of my home, you have no access to it. Mm. I know some of us got some folk living with us and still don't listen to us. In your house, but living by their rules. You ain't got to say amen, say ouch. And they make it up as they go along and then ask you to get along. Yeah, but in these days, the owner of the home set the tone for the home. He allowed what was permissible and he barred was what was unaccessible. Can I tell you something? The, the father of those days is like the father of these days. God is the one that grants access. So let me help somebody. All them folk you trying to keep out of church, get out of the doorway. Because what you don't want in here, daddy wants in here. He wants hoes and harlots. He wants pimps and prostitutes. He wants drug dealers and the impoverished. That group camping outside, he wants them on the front bench. It might be bothering your car, but it don't bother your Christ. He said, I didn't come for the well. I came for the sick. See, I don't have medicine to make your six-pack better. I have medicine to deliver you from a hunger you can't satisfy. See, my medicine ain't for casual pains. My medicine is for critical pains. Father wants to turn, return access to those he has given entrance to. I'm almost done. Not only is there responsibility to him, from the command and the confidence in that verse. But there's also the, the comparison made, verses 9 through 11. Pull up verse 9, Sylvia. Or if you ask a fish, go back on verse 9. Or what is man? Or what man is there of you of whom his son asks bread? And he will give him a stone. Who's ever seen Wonder Bread? Come on, raise your hand if you ever had a, come in a nice loaf all sliced. Some good stuff. Some good stuff. My mama didn't allow us to eat Wonder Bread. We ate the generic bread from a place called Liberty Supermarket. We had a picture of Lady Liberty on it. and I would go back there and grab the Wonder Bread because that was what was on TV. And my mama would say, if you don't put that Wonder Bread down, you're going to wonder what hit you. I went back and got the Liberty store bread. Didn't cost what Wonder Bread cost, but... I found out in my adult life that the Wonder Bread slice tasted just like the Liberty slice. Matter of fact, it, it looked different, but when I put it in my mouth, it tasted the same. I learned an important lesson that day. That sometimes I'm paying for the package, not the content. That'll come, that'll help you somewhere else later. But here, Jesus is not only telling his Disciples that discernment is required. He's watching to see if you can use it without him. Y'all know discernment works in more than just spiritual places. I, I, I got Bible evidence for you. Hear this statement. Jesus makes an illustration saying bread can't be given if a stone is what's sought. And we don't understand the comparison because we're looking at rocks and a loaf of wonder bread. Again, Biblical culture ain't yours. Bread wasn't sliced. It wasn't in a loaf. It wasn't processed and packaged. Matter of fact, to prepare that bread might have been in a flat, circular metal object. And it was stuck into an open-air fire and baked, not to a fluffy rising yeast was for the wealthy, it was baked into a unleavened cake, similar to a pancake. Mm, I'm, I'm trying to help. Matter of fact, if you took that bread and set it out on the rocks at the Sea of Galilee, you wouldn't be able to tell what was a rock and what was a loaf of bread. Hmm. wonder what discernment would ask me to do. It would say, know the difference between feeding folk inedible things and feeding folk good food. And the difference can be discerned by look. I see a verse here. Taste 
and see. Don't listen and hear. Participate, activate, digest, and consume, and see that the Lord is good. See, some of you think you got God, but you're trying to swallow rocks. Those hard things can't be bitten into. They can't be digested. Matter of fact, when you bite hard things, they might break you before they make you. I wish somebody could say amen. Because I was somebody that didn't believe what folks said. I had to see it for myself. My old folk would say, you don't believe fat meat greasy. I said, I sure don't. Not unless I touch it. I had to handle it and see. And I'm glad that Jesus understands me. Oh, y'all ain't got to say amen. Thomas said amen. I think I, I heard this from this pulpit. I won't believe unless I put my hand in the nail print. I won't believe unless I stick my hand in. See, y'all have tried God, never tasted him. And some of you found him to be hard and too hard to digest. And I would caution you, you picked up a rock. You didn't find the rock. Better discernment can tell you what's good for food and what's good for building. Not only that, verse 10. He says, or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? Some of y'all can't see the difference between, what's that fish we love to eat, catfish? Nah, y'all ain't really eating fish. Whitening, red snapper. It's definitely some other species for y'all. Catfish are bottom dwellers. They're the garbage cans of, of shallow water. You love them fillets, they will eat absolute waste just to feed you on Friday in a bucket of Crisco. Don't lie, you know you ain't baking it. You frying that fish. Know your audience, know your audience. In the biblical sense though, y'all, there were species of fish that were really water serpents. See, their design made them perfect camouflage for unsuspecting prey. See, you would think you're about to eat something productive. And what you would find out either is something productive is now poisonous or something is being productive off digesting you. See, some of those sea serpents weren't to be eaten, they did the eating. They were pariah-like in their appetite. Y'all, the Bible tells me, discern the difference between fish and snakes. Do y'all know the difference? No. No, no. Look to your left. Now look to your right. Did you see a snake or a fish? Help me. You tell me what you saw. Let me say this. If you didn't see it, remember, you looked left and right, but you didn't look in. What you're looking for might be not around you. Could be you. See, I, I know that's true because sometimes even the sheep have claws because they're really wolves. In sheep, the, the, didn't the Bible say that? Our problem is our discerning skills are limited at their best. We can only see what the outside presents, but we have a God who can discern from the inside out. There's some things you're going to stay away from because it looks nasty. And God says, from where I sit, that looks like your answer. You say, God, but it ain't shiny. It ain't gold. It ain't clean. He says, not where you can see. But if you'll trust what I see on your behalf, pick up some stuff nobody else would. And go some places nobody. In, in closing, our obligation is not only, not only to the world, but it's also to the world. We're responsible. 
verse 11 and verse 12 as I close. If then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Raise your hand if you're a parent. Surrogate by birth, by adoption, by selection. That some little person might call you, you like a daddy. That's an honor. Or you're like a mama. That's an honor. Everybody got an idea then, right? I don't know how the Bible can use the term evil and parent in the same paragraph. I never understood how Jesus would say, unless you hate your mother and your father. That, that, I, that has always been a hard saying from the mouth of Jesus. Do you know whole theological schools have been divided on what the intent of that word is? So I'm going to give you a rodism and not a godism. I think I figured something out. Now remember, it ain't biblical, but it's got some ballast to it. Have you ever, ever had a moment where you felt somebody genuinely loved you. Come on, I, I need you not to think, not to answer quick, think hard. Somebody who knew all your faults and still found you attractive. Somebody you had to hide no secrets from. You, you never had to lie. You never had to think of an alternative story. You never had to pretend to be something you weren't. For most of us, outside of our house, that is a rare occurrence. Some of us have even been in long-term marriages still concerned about some dark secrets popping out and ending what has by thus far been a stellar marriage. Oh yeah, we, you live in agony that that thing might come out and that love that you've groomed will disappear. Because once you've had a taste of genuine love, nothing else satisfies you. Matter of fact, there are some other good things that still make you feel good. But when you compare it to the thing that was good, that good thing almost looks bad. Y'all following what I'm focused on? He ain't telling you to hate your parents. He's saying your love for him ought to look like hate compared to the love you have for your mama and your daddy. He's saying your love for God ought to look like hate when you compare it to the love of your homeboys and your girlfriends, your clique or your gang, your brotherhood or your fraternity, or your sorority or your job. So we got some folk that we call our friend friend. And God says compared to our friendship, that ought to look like an enemy rather than a friend. See, we don't know how to hate good things because we don't know how to love perfect things. See, God has such a wonderful love that his love for us doesn't need love from us back to him. His love for us is enough love for us and everybody else. It's unconditional. So when he said, you're evil, He's saying, you're good parents, but I'm perfect. You do good things for your kids, but tell the truth. Some of y'all would go to jail for your kids. Let somebody push them down. You done already made bail. You're going there with your, your order in hand because somebody's going to die tonight. I hear same folk go scary when you touch or threaten the ones they gave birth to. I've seen beautifully docile women become raging she-bears because somebody wronged their baby. There are stories of mothers who find their children in peril, lift cars off unconscious bodies, drawing off an adrenaline rush that could bend steel rather than let their baby boy struggle. I had a mama like that. Felt like she would turn the whole world upside down to keep me right side up. 
I felt like nobody would ever love me like Miss Elvira. Nobody would ever care for me like Miss Elvira. And then one day on the front bench at 109th Street at First Baptist Greymount, I met Jesus. And I know what my mama would do, but I found out what Jesus did do. And my mom would die, but Jesus did die. He won up on mama. And when mama stays in the grave, Jesus got up. And when mama went to heaven, she stays with the father. But Jesus says, I'll come back. I got to rethink. I might just like my mama because I really think I love Jesus. Because he's done for me what no parent could do. He's done for me what no homeboy could do. No gang, no fraternity, no job, no marriage, no friendship. He is everything, so everything else has to be nothing. I'm done. Verse 12. Verse 12 says, Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. What the hell? That's the hardest thing I ever had to hear. He broke me when he told me don't give them what they ask him for. Because which one of us don't want to do that? When folk keep prodding and pressing you. Keep playing you for a fool. Keep acting like you some youngster, adolescent, or don't know your place. You know you want to show them you all grown. You want to get somebody off you and make sure that they second think getting on anybody else after you get off them. You want to fix it for everybody that follows you. And Jesus says, that's a way, but it ain't mine. I'm not into vengeance. I'm into victory. And I don't win when somebody else is, is losing. I will take the loss so all can win. He says, I, I don't just command you to do unto them as you would have them. I'm going to show you what it looks like. When folk talk about you, I want you to bless them. When folk beat you, I want you to bear the wounds. When folk spit on you, not only should you not wipe it off, but honor, honor them with different landing spots for their spittle. Make your face more available to be disgraced. He says, when they take something from you, give them the rest of your stuff. Don't put up a fight. Don't become fierce. Don't lose focus. You ain't repaying them from what you're giving. You are giving them what you'd like to receive. And let me tell you why. They won't reciprocate, but the Father will. I got Bible for my theology. We stripped him naked and sent him to the taskmaster. They lashed his back with 39 lashes plus one, the wage of a runaway slave. They had a cat of nine tails, not a leather whip. It had bone and metal in strips of leather, and as it dug into his back, it ripped flesh from his spine. They pressed thorns into his skull that penetrated the vital outward membrane. They marched him up a narrow road to the hill called Golgotha, place of skull. They laid him on a crossbeam and drove rivets through his wrists and one through both ankles. They leaned him up on an upright beam and let his body weight pull to gravity's demand. And when he wouldn't die quickly, they tried to hasten death by stabbing him in the side with a spear piercing vital organs. And when they had decimated, disgraced, and destroyed his body, he said, it is finished. That was Friday. On Sunday, 
the first day of the week. He got up, not with a bloody body, but with a transformed body. Not a crown of thorns, but a crown of God's pleasure and honor. No wounds that were affecting his movement, but now he's free to be all places at all times. And what was opened in his side for his death is now open in his side for our eternal life. And what water ran out for the release of his kidneys, it washed over us for the purging of our earthly sins. And what bled out as a life force from his body bled into us as a life force for our body. What they tore up, the Father got up. And what Jesus says is, I did it all so he wouldn't do it to you. I bore it all so you wouldn't have to bear it. Don't repay their evil with evil. Give evil the kindness you didn't ask for. Give evil the forgiveness you didn't receive. Give evil the past that you were allowed. Because his coming down was our going up. His burial was our resurrection. And his resurrection is our eternal life. The altar is that call for us. But you have to discern, is this a table holding the Bible? Or is the place where I meet Jesus? Don't confuse it as a location. This is a journey. When you get up now, you're not saying yes to church attendance. You're saying yes to Christ's fellowship. Salvation ain't about being in a building. Salvation is about becoming the body. You ain't got to come to church. I want you to be the church. I don't want you to bring folk to two and H. I want you to take Jesus wherever you go. And if you've never said yes to Jesus, this may be your last chance. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow ain't promised. And if I read the news right, we seem to be on the brink of world war. I ain't trying to scare you. I'm just trying to say, when you hear these things, Wars, rumors of wars, when the weather is unpredictable, when the culture is unsettled, when society has turned upside down, Jesus says, I am on my way back. No man knows the day or the hour when he appears. All we know is when he comes, the dead will rise. We'll be caught up and changed, and then we'll be taken to the place prepared. And I don't know about you. I don't know how you feel about where your destination will be, but I'd rather know I'm going to be with Jesus than to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. Tomorrow is not my concern. Today I have Jesus, and I'm satisfied. No, 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 I ain't got all my bills paid, but Jesus paid it all. No, no, all my problems ain't fixed, but Jesus solved all my problems. He, he might still have left me with a headache, but he didn't leave me with a soul pain. He fixed my eternal problem. I'll handle my physical ones. And somebody needs to say yes to Jesus and not to the church. You're not coming for membership. You're coming for a Savior. And you have to recall a time that you said yes to Jesus, where you sacrificed everything to him. I can't tell you when that was. You've got to tell me. It was a Friday for me when I heard that hell wasn't a party. When I heard that the imps and demons weren't pimps and players, that it would be gnashing of teeth and pain and constant torture, I ain't want to go to hell. And the preacher says, all you got to do, believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I said, I believe. He said, do you believe he died and rose again? I said, yes, sir, I do. Will you ask him to come into your heart and forgive you and save you and lead you? Yes, sir, I will. That was 23 years ago. It took me this long to figure out that salvation is still free, that it's eternally securing, and I can never lose it. Because on that day, I didn't believe what I believe on this day. It was time every day trusting what Jesus said to me. 
believing that his words were true and that he could not lie. Putting him to the test that if I lived the way he said to live, he would do what he promised to do. I'm a living witness that even when you can't ask for what you need, he can give you what you can't ask for. I was in a coma, ready to die. He decided that I will live. I didn't ask for it, but he had a plan and a purpose, and I'm going to let him have his way. Today is your day. Discern that this might be your only time. You got to figure out that you've heard the gospel a lot, but today feels different. Today feels critical for me. If I don't do it today, I might not get it tomorrow. I got to say yes to Jesus. And I'll spend the rest of my life figuring out what that yes means. But today, when I hear his voice, I got to respond because I might not get another chance. I ain't trying to be a prophet. I'm just saying there's somebody here that needs to say yes to Jesus. That's somebody who feels like all your answers have failed you. I need you to ask Jesus, show me if this is the answer for me. And if you hear him saying, come, I really need you not to worry about what folk might say. They are talking about you right now and you have done nothing. So give them something to talk about. Get up and say, this was the day I said yes to Jesus. And I don't even understand what that means, but I will spend the rest of my life figuring it out. I'll go where I can hear the preached word. I'll surround myself with people who believe it. I'll keep asking questions until I understand. I'll pray and ask God to reveal it to me. And like the old folks say, and we'll understand it better. By and by. Can you come today? and say yes to salvation. Maybe not salvation. Maybe you're already secure in your relationship with Jesus, but maybe you've fallen out of relationship with the church. Maybe you asked for something or sought something or knocked for access to something and people said, no, don't blame the Father for what folk do. The church is not the one that hurts you. People hurt you. The church was made as a place where God continually makes you into the image of Christ. We know the church ain't a palace full of perfect people. It's a hospital full of sick folk. I don't go to church. Hypocrites in there. This is where hypocrites get faithful. I don't go to church. Liars in there. Here's where liars become truth sayers. I don't go in there. Ain't nothing but fornicators in there. I tell you. There's some fornicators out there too, but you stay in the world. But here's where fornicators find faithful spouses. Be patient with one another. God is not done with any of us. Finished will be pure gold. We are works in progress. But the church needs a believer to believe in the founder more than the building. Will you come today? And plant your membership here where we read the Word of God, study the Word of God, believe the Word of God, and try to live the Word of God. That's membership. How about prayer? Jesus said prayer is the answer to discernment. If you talk to the Father, He guides you minute by minute on what you're supposed to do. Can I tell you how discernment looks different? I got a text that said all ushers wear purple. I laid out my paper, purple shirt. I got one just like theirs. And then all of a sudden, some said, grab that black one. I threw the black one in the bag. And as soon as I walked in the back door, a sea of black shirts saw me. And I wanted to say, look, that was lucky. Look, that was fate. But I'm a believer. Look, that was God. And you swear he don't care about your shirt? Yeah, he does. God cares about everything concerning his children. Just like you care about everything concerning your kid. Guess what? God is concerned that we don't pray enough. He's concerned that when we pray, we ask for personal things and not things for all of God's children. He's worried that we're not seeking first the kingdom and its righteousness. So I'm inviting you to a different kind of prayer. If you want to pray so that God can have control, if you want to pray where you surrender all your decision-making, 
If you want to pray where you let go of making decisions based on whim or like or fate, but say, I will seek God in every way I know how. I will try to put his word to my life. I'll do my best, and when I fail, I'll go to him to put me back. If you're ready for that kind of commitment, the altar is open. Because I think we've asked for enough stuff. We've asked for enough money. We've asked for enough good health. It's still appointed unto man once to die. But there have been good works prepared for you before the foundation of the earth, and they are still undone. I need God to do it through me. I want God to use us to accomplish his will on earth. We got to get over our petty differences. We got to stop retaliating against verbal barrages against our lives. We got to stop being provoked into anger and remember that we have a God that can keep us in perfect peace. We got to ask for his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm glad you responded. Maybe you're not ready to respond physically, but you're responding spiritually, the Holy Spirit sees what no person in this church can see. If your heart is opening to God, he's coming in right now with heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's pray. God, we heard the word today and we were convicted and convinced that we started asking and we stopped. We started seeking and we ceased. We began knocking and we took entrance for granted. But God, we repent of any bad behavior and disobedience. I'm letting go of being in charge of my life again. That day I said yes to your salvation, I surrendered myself. God, I know others are at this altar knowing that it ain't necessarily the attack of the enemy. It might be the control of the self. But God, we come yielding our control to yours. We come saying, God, we've made a mess of our lives. You can make a miracle of it. That we've been those who participated in wrong. You can make us ministers for your righteousness. So God, use us as your spiritual examples. Let us be your Holy Spirit billboard. Speak to us and we will obey. Guide us and we will follow. Lead us in the path of everlasting. Let us simply open our mouths and trust you'll put words of life in them. You'll give us the power to speak. We come rededicating our time, our talent, our treasure, our touch back to the hands of the master. We've been good parents to our earthly children, but you've been a perfect parent. Because you are a heavenly father that can give only the right gifts at all times. So God, we're asking... We're seeking, we're knocking. Your word declares that we ought to have confidence that you will do what you said you will do. We love you, God. And although our problems still remain, we know that the hands that guide them have changed. And you've got it all in your hands now. Do what we can, and we'll give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say amen. If you made a decision for salvation, for membership, for prayer, will you reach out to Christian Love Modesto at gmail.com and let our decision time ministry know. And for the loved ones in the building, for Preach to Teach Wednesday, in the Word Wednesday, there are seven questions in the back for you. Ushers will be distributing those forms for you, members, loved ones, to take as your spiritual work. And we will get together on Wednesday and see what the Holy Spirit has said to what the sermon supplied. Amen. We're going to let our announcement clerk come. We're going to bless the food that has been brought for our fellowship time. And then we're going to get the benediction. Here you go, Sister Ann. First time visitors, can you stand please? <laughs> Welcome on behalf of
of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Pastor Cochran, and the club welcome you. We hope something was said today to bring you closer to Christ and closer to us. Remember the first time you're a visitor, after this, you're stuck with us. We're family. Would you like to have a word? <laughs> no. We have a gift for you, though. Yes, we do. Come on, stand up. Let's give them our gift. Okay, these are the announcements that I'm not reading. <laughs> and we're going to start with, if you have any announcements, see Sister Janine before Wednesday or by Wednesday every week. There is no next-gen meeting tonight. In the word Wednesday, Pastor already talked about that. If you did not get your slip of paper from an usher, please make sure you get it on the way out. Kingdom Kids, this Saturday, they're going to Sky Zone. That's the place where you jump up and down. And I won't be there because I'm not going to be. I know because no old folks. <laughs> okay? One to three, meet there. One to three, Sky Zone in McHenry Village off McHenry. Yeah, I know. I don't need candy. <laughs> Do you know where Steve's candy is? That's where it is. <laughs> Okay, also, next gen, as I stated, nothing tonight, but it's coming up in, on the fourth Sunday. Kingdom, Kingdom Kids is growing. We will be adding a third class. Our classes. And if we get enough volunteers, it'll be one Sunday every other month. Hey, so okay, waiting on you to volunteer. Got that, waiting on you to volunteer. Okay, Sister Yana, can you please stand? Oh, you're standing. See, right on cue. That's what dancers do. They're on cue, on time. Okay, April 26th and 27th at 7 p.m. at Thomas Downey Auditorium. $10 cash, $11 for the car. We're going to support her in her last high school performance. High school, that's not saying you exempt from here. Just want you to know. We still want you up here. Okay, Suicide Prevention and Education Coalition. See the phone number, 209 Sisterhood Swap and Shop plan on May 18th. It will be here. Get your things, get your items together. And then we'll probably have soup and sandwiches. Planning Committee for Pastor and Wife's Appreciation. The next meeting will be on April 25th, and that will be in person. Here, 6.30. Be here. Vacation Bible School. We're still looking for volunteers. Put it on your calendar, please. Next meeting is April 13th. How about this? That's, uh, that was yesterday. So we did have that meeting. I was at work. 
okay? The actual Vacation Bible School will go from the 10th through the 14th. But I want to back up. We do need volunteers still. So if you are willing to volunteer one night, just only one night. See, thank the Lord for that too. How's that? Thanks the Lord for everything. Graduation and promotional Sunday, June 9th. Get ready to fill out the forms. We'll have them next week. That's for everyone, everyone promoting to the next grade level, not just those who are graduating. June 9th, Gospel Fest is this coming weekend. I would say I'm going to have tickets Wednesday, but I can't guarantee that. However, if you get your tickets from me, you don't have the service fee. So if you do want a ticket, let me know today, and I will make sure I have them on Wednesday night when you come, because you'll be here for In the Word Wednesday. Right? Okay. I would like to say... Read that. Goodbye. See you over there. Bless the food. That was a great non-reading of the announcement. All right. If all hearts and minds are clear, there's a pair of glasses left at the back. Please see the ushers if you've misplaced your reading or vision glasses. Amen. All right. If all hearts and minds are clear, let's stand and get our benediction. Sister Elizabeth, you in here? She in here? Hey, she's come, come right here. Um, as we come out, since she has rededicated with this new baptism, we should refellowship her into the body of Christ. So when we get our benediction before you go to the fellowship hall, come and greet our sister, making this huge recommitment to the Lord to follow in baptism. Amen. So let's pray. I thank you for everything our eyes have seen and ears have heard. And God, we thank you for the word you planted in us. Challenge and charge us to look at things with spiritual discernment. Not looking what is just good to us, but seeing what you have good for us. Lead us to your perfect will, God. We don't admit we're perfect. We'll make mistakes. But you say as often as we ask, you'd be faithful to begin us again. So God, we want to continually ask, seek, and knock for access, entrance, and provision into your word, your will, and your way. We're about to leave this place, God, but we can never leave your presence. We ask that you would not only go with us, but God, go before us. Clear the way of hurt and harm and danger and let us arrive at our varying destinations and find everything that you have purposed it for us. Bless the food. Bless the hands that have prepared it. Let it all be nourishing to our bodies. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Let us all say amen. amen. Fist bump somebody. Come hug our sister in Christ. And we love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Carry on, loved ones. <laughs>